let's get into a glossary. Now, I wanted to start off just really quick before we get into content. Um, I just gave you a printable list if you want to print this out. Again, I highly suggest flashcards. For some of you, that's a great learning tool to write it out, the word and the definition. Um, you might consider a couple of stacks of three by five cards. Some of you are maybe into Quizlet. Um, and I think if you go on to Quizlet, you'll find that there's other students that have used that method to study for um, a real estate exam. So there might be some tools out there for you to already use. Um, but some of you, that's a great learning device. I don't care what you do. I just want you to do what serves you best. Um, and if this can be helpful, of course, that's why we're doing it. Now, um, I would not personally recommend buying a pre-made stack of flashcards. I know that there's a couple of companies that sell them. Personally, I found that there's way too much content in it. And it's actually more than I think you need to know for the exam. I think you need to stay hyper-focused on what's on that actual exam. And some of these big box brands, they're putting in real estate terms that maybe don't even apply to Iowa. So that's why I kind of want to keep you protected from that a little bit. Now, into the glossary, if someone has told you that the real estate exam is basically a glorified vocabulary test, that's cute. But they maybe have lied to you just a little, just a little bit, um, because I think the glossary is important and knowing the basis of the term, but the exam questions when you show up to the test center, um, or if you're doing it from home, the actual exam is going to be more situational. You've got to know how to use this vocabulary. So yes, it is the foundation, but I do believe they'll build on it a little bit more than just what is the definition of abstract of title, right? So I wanted to do a so far, we've tried to not only discuss the content, but how it applies in your career. That's why I share all of my stories with you is so you not only know the what, but maybe the why and the how. Now, as you've gotten through all of these sections and quizzes, and we're doing some healthy review for you, you still have an 80 question national exam and a 40 question state exam to complete and then let's get this course done for you. Um, so I wanted to go back to kind of some basics though is my goal with this glossary. This is going to cover content of A through D. And the first one is an abstract of title. Um, an abstract again is that legal document that is like the autobiography of the property. It gives a summary um, of all the deeds, all the documents that prove who owns the property, and a list of any encumbrances that relate to this property, such as mortgage liens, um, easements, deed restrictions. Okay, those are going to be the big ones. Um, I do think acceleration clause, and as I said, I'm not going to maybe hit all of these, but I really want to narrow in on a majority of them, though, that I think will be helpful. Acceleration clause is actually a mortgage term. Acceleration clause um, says that the lender or the bank that you borrowed the money from to purchase the property has the right to move up the balance due date if a borrower defaults on the payment. So let's say a borrower falls on hard times and can't make a mortgage payment one month. And they think, oh, you know what? I've got 30 years to pay this sucker off. I'll get it caught up. No, no. If you start missing payments, the bank very well is going to slide the due date up to now and call that balance due. It's an acceleration clause, okay? Accrued items. Um, we talk about this with the closing disclosure when we're settling out the balance between what a buyer is bringing to the closing table for their down payment, closing costs, 
and then maybe the amount that they're borrowing from a bank. And then we're transferring that money and paying a series of bills off for the seller. Their mortgage, uh, real estate commissions, um, any additional fees. And then at the end, we've got a proceeds, hopefully for the seller um, of what their net is after paying off all those things. Part of that settlement statement that we call a closing disclosure is going to have prepaid or accrued items. Accrued means that there is a credit to the buyer at the time of closing. It's also a debt on the seller side. What that means is the seller needs to pay for something, but the bill isn't due yet. And typically it's gonna be property taxes especially in Iowa. Um, property taxes, when they come due, is for the entire year, for example, on the exam. It'll be a year to date. Don't worry about what happens in Iowa. That means the seller needs to make the buyer whole for the time that they own the property, but the bill isn't due yet. So for example, if we've got a closing on August 17th, but the tax bill isn't due until December 31st, the seller owes a credit to the buyer from January 1st through closing date on August 17th for the time they own the property, but the taxes aren't due until the end of the year. They're going to do an accrued item with that, prorate it. The seller will give a credit to the buyer at the time of closing. And then when the bill comes due at the end of December, the buyer is made whole for when the seller owned it and when they owned it. An addendum, you'll use this term a lot in your career. This is where we add additional information to a contract. Common additions might be adding a blank addendum where you maybe need to write out the legal description because there wasn't enough room um, on the purchase agree agreement where it normally is allowed need a little bit more space. Another type of addendum would be inspection items. So you get a deal accepted between a buyer and a seller. The buyer has an inspection contingency. They do their inspection and then they ask the seller to make some basic repairs. Usually those repairs are going to be fire, health, or safety, or repair over $500. It's not a way to bring the house up to code or repair cosmetic items. When they do that and they're negotiating what's gonna get fixed, um, we agree to that on an addendum. And now that just becomes an additional page to the purchase agreement. Um, adjustable rate mortgage, this is known as an ARM loan, A-R-M. Um, this is a mortgage where it's probably fixed for a set period of time, maybe three, five, seven, 10 years. And then that means on the next year, if you've got a 5-1 arm, for example, on the sixth year, the interest rate could adjust up to a full point. So it's not fixed for the entire life of the loan. Um, air rights, I'm sure you understand that with land, there are surface, subsurface, and air rights. Um, an alienation clause, this is a good one for you to know under the mortgage category and financing, we'll have eight test questions on that. Um, and a, an alienation clause means that the balance of the mortgage must be paid in full if the property is transferred in any way to another party, either by will, by gift, or by sale. So if I buy 123 Banana Street and I get a loan to buy it, and then I decide I want to move, I can't sell 123 Banana liens so they must be settled out every time you close. Agree that because of a repair that was agreed to with the inspection addendum 
the repair can't get done on time and therefore they dis all, everybody decides to delay closing. Not totally uncommon. Unfortunately, we've got to rely on vendors to sometimes make major roof repairs. And in a time where maybe there's been a heavy storm come through, everybody needs their roof repaired, right? So it's a long wait time. That might be a time that maybe both parties decide, let's delay closing for another week until this project is done. Um, and we change something on the contract. It's an amendment. An amortized loan is where all of the payments are fixed. Um, between interest and principal. Um, it is the same payment every month for every out loud, 360 payments. Um, all of the principal and interest payments will remain the same. It's an amortized loan. Anticipation. This would be a question that's going to fall under the appraisal category or valuation. You'll have six test questions on that. Anticipation is a term used in the appraisal world that means the value can be affected by the occurrence or non-occurrence of a certain event. Maybe values go up because we hear Amazon is building a, a fulfillment facility in the area, or maybe values go down because we hear the local manufacturing plant is closing. Those would be a couple of ideas. And again, the best time is to sell now before any of those um, manufacturing plants close, right? Antitrust laws. You are going to um, probably need the definition of this. An antitrust law is a federal law that prohibits monopolies and companies who do anything that would disrupt the free flow of goods and services. There are five types of antitrust laws. I think three of them are important for you on the exam. Price fixing, group boycott, and tying agreement. And again, on the exam, you could have maybe two to four test questions just around those antitrust laws. Um, the appraisal. This is a great test question again for you under valuation. This is an opinion of market value, market value, not insurance price, maybe not even sales price, but it is an opinion of market value. The most likely price that a buyer is willing to pay and a seller is willing to sell it for, okay? Um, a balloon loan payment. This could be a question, again, under finance, where you've got eight test questions coming. This is a partially amortized loan. Balloon loans, for example, might be five years, but they're going to amortize the loan um, as though it's 30. So if you've got 12 payments over five years, that's 60 total payments. All 59 payments are, you're going to pay it like it was a 30 year mortgage. But at the 60th payment, you've got this big balloon of money that you've got to pay off in order to settle this loan. So it's partially amortized because the last month is not, is the one that's not amortized. Um, a bill of sale. We talked about addendums and amendments. A bill of sale does not go with the purchase agreement. It's a separate document where both parties can agree um, to do something or not do something. Typically, a bill of sale is going to be how you transfer personal property. Let's say a seller decides they want to leave behind the patio furniture. That does not go on a real estate sales contract because it's not real estate. It's personal property. So it's best to go on a bill of sale. Blockbusting. This is going to be a question around fair housing. Fair housing falls under the category of practice of real estate. You should have about 11 test questions around practice of real estate. And of those 11, I would say 
five, maybe six could be just around fair housing. Blockbusting is one of those terms. I think it's very likely you'll need to know and you certainly need to know it for your career. Blockbusting is the act of encouraging sellers to move because of a protected class moving into the neighborhood. And then you dangle this carrot that says, if you don't sell now, your property values are going to plummet because this protected class is moving in and you're not gonna like it. It's also a term known as white flight or panic selling, okay? Um, let's go down to broker protection clause. Um, this is a part of a listing contract that protects all the buyer leads that a broker or their agent created because of their marketing efforts. That way the seller can't try to cut the broker or the agent out and sell directly to those leads. A broker's price opinion. One question that you might have on this is who can do a broker price opinion? And really it can be an appraiser, an agent or a broker. Um, it's really a less expensive version, um, but it does not need to be done by a licensed appraiser. Only an actual appraisal needs to be done by a certified licensed appraiser. These broker price opinions oftentimes are done by agents and brokers used for maybe refinancing, home equity lines of credit, or to help a bank establish a most likely sales price when they relist something that they've taken into inventory because of a foreclosure, okay? Building code. Um, a building code are um, safety standards established either by a uniform building code or by local um, laws, um, by even your city, not county or state, but even city by city. They can vary just a little bit. Building code, again, is for safety. It is different than those deed restrictions. The city is the one that is going to regulate these. The deed restrictions about that specific development, those are gonna be re regulated either by the developer or if the developer has sold all the lots or all the units, then it's going to go to a homeowners association. Okay, that has some sort of board. Capital gain. Um, I'm going to relate this to a 1031 tax exchange. Um, anytime that we've got a net gain, net, not gross, net means we take what we're selling it for minus what we originally paid, what we invested in the property for maintenance, and any fees to sell it. So the net gain. Anytime it's over these thresholds mentioned, the government wants some dollars, right? It's a form of tax. A way to avoid that that is a legal program by the IRS is to put it in an exchange. That allows you to buy similar property within a certain period of time and avoid paying that tax. Specifically, it's called a 1031 tax exchange, okay? Um, that CRV, that Certificate of Reasonable Value, um, I would say that would maybe be a good term for you to know around a VA loan. Again, that could be a candidate for a financing question. Closing disclosure forms, I mentioned those earlier in this video. That is the document that shows the final figures between a buyer and a seller to close the transaction. So it's going to have the closing costs and the price that the buyer paid for the property, that totals up. Then they're going to have a loan to cover some of it or cash. Um, and they're gonna need to bring all those monies in and it's gonna say exactly to the penny how much money they need um, to make that transaction whole. Then we go over to the seller side, the money they have coming in, all the bills that we pay on their behalf, and then again, hopefully what their net proceeds is at the end. Um, a comparative market analysis. This is a way to establish the value of a property 
based on active pending and sold properties within the same neighborhood. Um, I do think that you will have maybe a conditional use permit that usually runs along with a variance or um, a couple of uh, zoning terms like that. Um, this gives permission for other types of uses um, that would normally be prohibited. So for example, if you've got a property that's zoned agriculture, you could apply for a conditional use permit in order to build a place of worship or a church there. Condominium. This is ownership through a traditional deed. Um, and it includes shared spaces with your neighbors, such as hallways, elevators, green spaces, parking lots, parking spaces. And then that is regulated through a homeowners association and how the deed restrictions are written. That's how the homeowners association um, proceeds. Okay. Um, let's go down to cooperative. It often runs in conjunction with the condominium, but the difference is, is it's not a traditional deed. It's a proprietary lease. You basically own stock in the corporation in exchange for the unit that you buy. And as the real estate market goes up and appreciates, so will the value of that stock for when you go to resell it. The cost approach. Um, the cost approach is going to be the type of um, appraisal. So again, this goes under valuation. There are six test questions again on that. The cost approach is where we go and we take the property back down to bare land. We reconstruct the property and then we decrease its value based on three types of depreciation, physical, functional, and external factors known as external obsolescence. Cost approach is great for very unique properties that you don't have a lot to compare to. And you don't have any income, right? There's the income approach. You don't have any income on these. You don't charge rent. So it would be, for example, maybe a church that's been converted to a house. Um, unique commercial. Um, th there's not a lot to compare it to that might be a great time to use the cost approach. That might be a question. Um, they'll give you this scenario and want to know what's the best type of approach to use for the appraiser, okay? Counter offer is a good one. Um, just as a reminder, a counter offer means that original offer no longer exists. Debt to income, I'm going to pop down there. Um, debt to income, I think that um, knowing the definition is great. This is a math candidate um, where you know the amount of debt to income, um, where we use maybe those front end and back end ratios. Typically, 28 and 36% is what we used in our practice, um, but often what I've seen as examples on the exam as well. Deed restrictions are part of the provisions of a deed that say what type of property can be built on the property, how the property can be used. They're created by a land developer or a homeowners association. And really what they're probably trying to do is create some for, form of fair living so you don't have some neighbors with no pets and some with 110 pound dogs, right? Everyone's allowed the same 35 pound dog or two cats. Like that's the standard. So it does help with some living standards, but for a developer where I really think it's helpful is conformity. Believe it or not, conformity helps the value of properties. Um, otherwise you're gonna have a mini McMansion next to a tiny house. And trust me, that mini McMansion is obviously going to affect the value. Um, of the McMansion. <clears throat> Discount points. Um, I think that this is a math candidacy. Um, it's a financing term, but I think it could be one of your eight 
math questions. Just keep in mind a discount point is 1% of the amount borrowed, 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 not the purchase price, not the appraised value, but the amount borrowed from the lender or bank. Doctrine of prior appropriation. Um, this means that in areas where water sources are scarce, you need to get permission to plant crops. Um, a dual agent is a licensee who represents both the buyer and the seller in the same transaction. It does not mean you represented the buyer to buy one, two, three banana street. And then you also represented them to sell their current property. Dual agency means you represent a buyer and a seller, same transaction. Okay, and in order to do dual agency in Iowa, you must have consent from both parties. Up next, we're gonna get into glossary terms, E through L.